We've got Rangers, we've got Canadians, and we've got a very special crossover edition of Locked On New York Rangers and Locked On Montreal Canadiens. You're Locked On the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back, Ranger fans and Canadian fans. Like I said, very special crossover edition of both shows here today. This is John Chick with Locked On New York Rangers, joined here by Laura Saba of Locked On Montreal Canadiens. And Laura, how are we doing today? We are fantastic. Thank you so much for suggesting this. I think there's so many things that Canadians fans can learn from Rangers fans. Yeah, it's kind of an old school rivalry, but, you know, we don't see each other all that often because obviously it's a out of division matchup, but they had a crazy... <laughs> They had a crazy game earlier this season and um, maybe more of the same in this one. You know, we'll see how it goes. But we should also quickly let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on Rangers and Locked on Canadians is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. And, of course, both shows are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, uh, Laura, one of my first questions for you, obviously, former New York Ranger, Marty St. Louis, he was here for the last you know season and a half of his uh of his career and uh, obviously was part of the ranger team that made it to the finals and a couple of years ago you know he takes over uh mid-season for the canadians and i'm just wondering you know obviously they're, they're they were facing a rebuild when he came in but you know they've struggled at times how does everybody feel about the job that he's done thus far and you know are you are you and other canadian fans you know still feeling confident in st louis so I think it's a, a little bit of a mi mixed bag and there is some context to it, right? He is a coach with no head coaching experience, not, not at the professional level and barely even at the non-professional level, right? It was, he was teaching, he was coaching children. So coming into it, he's somebody that, you know, thinks the game of hockey really well. And he has like a cerebral approach to it. He's got a very, he's got a lot of ideas. He wants to implement them. You're also working with a team that is extremely uh, early in their rebuild phase. And you're also working with so far all like two and a half seasons or right now it's like two full seasons, I guess, um, of Martin St. Louis tenure, the injuries have been astronomical and they've always been to key players. And it was, you know, there's been many stretches of time where you've had a half AHL lineup, right? Like they've depleted the AHL lineup so much at times that they would have to sign people just to have bodies. So he's working with a lot of things against him. So you kind of have to contextualize it with that. One thing that he's done really well is he's brought back the confidence of certain players that were struggling on that front. For example, Cole Caulfield, like that infamous example where under Dominique Ducharme, he'd scored one goal <laughs> for half the season. And then under Martin St. Louis, it was like a renaissance. Like he clearly knows how to talk to players. They're always talking about wanting to walk through a wall for him. But tactically, we've also had certain questions about him. The power play isn't really improving, and we are going to get a little bit into that, I think, in our predictions, and we'll talk about how it's done a slight improvement, but it's more about personnel than strategy. But at the same time, so some of the problems that have plagued the Canadians for years and years, you're not seeing any new ideas on that front. And it's the same thing kind of with the defense as well. It doesn't really have an identity. So you have to kind of balance your criticism with whether he has the players that he would choose um, at his disposal and whether he's making decisions. And I do find that sometimes, I mean, I'm not one of those fans that's like, oh, it's all over. Uh, he's, but he's a bust. They should never have hired him. You know, they should only hire seasoned professionals, blah, blah, blah. I'm not that person, but I do think I do have questions about him coming in saying he has fresh ideas and he wants to change the way these players play. He wants to bring the fun back to the game. And then he'll play certain players that don't have a lot of experience, you know, a very little limited amount of time in the lineup. Um, yes, the Alonen comes to mind. Or he'll defer sometimes if there's too many mistakes that happen in a game or if somebody displeases him, he'll defer to the bench, the guy, and then go back to your veterans or overplay your veterans. So there's a little bit of old school mentality that he brings that people aren't necessarily asking for from a coach like Martin St. Louis. For the most part, though, the way that he's approached the players, the way the whole front office and this organization treats their players is very different. So you are feeling the motivation from the team. But sometimes I feel like when we're looking at Martin St. Louis, we have to remind ourselves like he's essentially a rookie. Like he's not he's not even coached like in the AHL or the ECHL or anything like that. You kind of have to remind yourself that he has to go through the growing pains and also learn the same lessons that a rookie player would learn. 
I was going to say, yeah, it almost sounds like uh, his like adventure that he's on right now or whatever you want to call it. It kind of mirrors that of the team where, you know, they're both kind of starting from scratch and everybody's kind of learning together. Um, but, you know, you touched on some of the younger players and how he's kind of rebuilt their confidence a little bit. And I wanted to ask you specifically about about those players. Um, you know, Suzuki having a really nice season, uh, 51 points in 53 games. You got Caulfield with 42 points in 53 games. And of course, Lovkovsky. Uh, off to, uh, you know, a solid start, obviously 19 years old, 27 points, 53 games. And, um, I mean, is that your top line for the next decade plus? I mean, does that sound good to you <laughs> and other Montreal fans? Is that kind of what everybody's kind of planning on over there and counting on? I hope so. And I think this is, this is the, this is the, I guess the, the whole point is, you know, these players are at this time, they have the freedom to kind of make those mistakes and really grow into their own. And we've seen the fact that like, it's kind of, it's forced patience with Nick Suzuki, right? Like he was on the team and he's been on this team. They've made, uh, they've gone all the way to the Stanley cup final, which I know, you know what that's like, but he's learned those lessons, but in context, like he's playing on a team that's not that great. And he's often having to be the guy, which is something that you generally see with top line centers, even on teams that are elite and deep down the middle, the, the 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 front lines or the the top line center has to be the guy so that patience is kind of really allowing him to mature and this season he's being mentioned in selkie conversations which is like a, a whole new step for him right whereas with cole caulfield like he's had he had like a really tough uh, second season in the nhl and then he's had some ups and downs like last year obviously he was phenomenal and then he, he had to be out with an injury um and he had to miss half the season so there's like there's there's a lot of uh shifts that you're seeing in their attitudes as well as like little things they're picking up about how to see the game how to read the game with Slavkovsky and I, I did want to bring this up a little bit later as well because we want to talk about some patience sometimes with with uh, rookie potential stars right this season, we're seeing why they picked him. But last season, there were a lot of questions about it, right? There were a lot of questions about his lack of experience or sometimes the way that he was playing was putting himself in position for freak injuries and things like that. He's got a new maturity to his game and he doesn't seem to be excitable anymore and excitable in the negative way where like he's like, you know, you get too into your head, um, you try to do too much and then you end up spectacularly failing, causing like chances against or anything like that. He's really, he's really picked up uh, the ability to use his strengths in such a way where we're seeing what the Canadians saw in him. Because I will tell you, there were a lot of question marks last season about him. But at the same time, on the flip side, I'm also seeing, you know, some of the smarter, more cerebral players. Unfortunately, he's injured right now. But uh, Jordan Harris, for example, right? He's somebody that you always knew was going to be reliable and smart. But Martin St. Louis showing him like or teaching him the patience a little bit like the it, it's really just um, sometimes he's 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 working on people's attitude and sometimes he's working on little things in their game. Like I think as a cohesive structure that, the, you know, his lineups might leave a little bit to to be desired or some of the decision making about who who he puts on the ice in certain situations um, might be a bit confusing. But on in on an individual level. It feels like the players that you want to see getting better for the future are the players that are getting better under Martin St. Louis. Yeah, makes sense. And, um, you know, one thing that I must ask you about, because you guys, you know, the, the Canadians recently traded Sean Monaghan away. Uh, he heads to Winnipeg. And I know the Rangers, you know, they're kind of in the market for uh, <laughs> probably a third line center at this moment, given that Philip is not going to be coming back this season. And obviously, again, all the best to Philip Hedl, But, you know, Montreal in return for Monaghan, they get a first round pick for next year, and then they have a conditional third round pick in 2027. But my understanding there is that they only get that pick if the Jets win the Stanley Cup this season, which is kind of an interesting, you know, condition that they have on it. But, <laughs> but so I guess you got to root for the Jets or, or something, you know, along those lines. But, but, um, I, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we'll, we'll see, right? But, exactly. um, it, how, how did you feel about, you know, them trading Monaghan in general? and um, do you think the return was fair? I mean, to me, it feels like a little bit of a seller's market this year, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that too. I think, so with Sean Monaghan, there's always the risk that he was going to get injured, right? So he is like, you know, you're talking about third line center. Like he's an extremely elite third line center. He is so good at anticipating plays. He's good defensively. He's good creatively. The knock on him has always been that he's 100% injury, injury prone. Like he's never going to be your top line center on a Stanley Cup winning team. But he was always reliable for depth and his intelligence is there. He just, his body's just been beat up and he can't, you know, he can't really keep up and, and all of that. So there's always 
a concern when you're trading for a Sean Monaghan. There's always that like, you know, that premium that the Canadians have to have to live without when you're trading him. So I think it was a good return for what Sean Monaghan might potentially turn out to be. That condition made me really la laugh really hard because it was really like, you know, you're telling the Canadians to put their money where their mouth is, right? Um, offering them that pick. Uh, Sean Monaghan is a big loss as a leader on this team. He's a big loss as a fan favorite on this team. The Canadians like him. The players like him. The fans love him. He brings a lot in terms of veteran presence, uh, intelligence, and you know, whenever he was on the ice, like he was making his line mates better. And that's really important. Every single instance, if somebody was slumping, they weren't a top line player, they'd go with Sean Monaghan, they'd get better. So that I think there's a lot of value to that. I would have liked to see a little bit more, but I think we're kind of, we don't have, we're not in the Ben Sherratt era where we got so much return for him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, he's a good player. You know, he's, he's not somebody that you know, he used to put up just crazy amounts of points back when he was playing with Goudreau back in Calgary. But uh, one of those guys that, like you said, he's just solid and reliable. And, um, you know, the Rangers, they were I talked about him a couple of times on my show. Obviously, the two teams couldn't come to an agreement or you liked Winnipeg's offer better. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what the Rangers look to do going forward. Um, and uh, Laura, I'm sure you're going to ask me a couple of questions about the Rangers and we'll get to that in just a second. First, though, we want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked on Rangers and Locked on Canadians is brought to you by Camino Consulting. How would you like to get to know someone better in an hour than you would in a year? Understanding one another better prevents small misunderstandings from becoming big ongoing fights. After providing more than 20 years of service to small and mid-sized businesses, helping management groups navigate conflict and onboarding new employees, Camino is offering a digital seminar for families and couples. Did your Valentine's gift of tickets to the game not go over as well as you'd hoped? Get the couples and family online seminar for 25% off for the month of February using the discount code locked on. Again, that is discount code locked on for 25% off for the rest of the month at www.caminoconsulting.ca or mention locked on when reaching out for a business seminar and receive the first five profiles free. And uh, Laura and I would also like to thank everybody for make, making Locked On Rangers and Locked On Canadians your first listens of the day, uh, both shows free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. So uh, with that, Laura, I'll kind of toss it over to you and I'm sure you got a couple questions about the Rangers and uh, I'm all ears. Yes. So there are a couple of questions that I wanted to talk to you as a Rangers fan. Um, what your experience has been with a rebuild? Because I feel like for the Rangers, it was a quick turnaround. And obviously there's a key player that was involved in the, in, in the same, you know, our Jeff Gordon used to be your Jeff Gordon. Um, and then there was like a sudden shift in attitude. And it was like, all right, we're cleaning house and we're going to go with Chris Drury. And it's, it's, it's you know, it, it felt like um, a lot of events happening all at once. And in Montreal, we're in a situation now where we have to have patience. We know like this is firmly, fully in a rebuild. We're not talking about playoffs for now. The players might be saying that, but we're not talking about that for now. So I wanted to understand kind of from a Rangers fan perspective, what lessons we can draw from, for one thing, franchise world-class goaltender retiring or leaving. And what happens? You know, how do you get over that? Um, is there hope for the future? <laughs> Are there people that can come in and fill that void? Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about Lafreniere, but I kind of want to, you know, from your perspective, what kinds of things can we expect and what should give us hope? Uh, or what did you find? What what gave you hope when the Can uh, well, the Rangers looked like it was like, all right, we're we're in full rebuild mode now? Yeah, I think that um the thing that kind of gave me hope was that it always felt like there was some kind of a plan in place, even if you didn't always necessarily agree with like every single thing that the organization did. Um, it felt like, you know, that they bring in, you know, and on one hand, you, you look at a move like this and you say, this isn't really the move that a rebuilding team does. But, you know, you bring in Artemi Panarin and I saw a couple of people like scratching their heads and it's like, well, why are they doing that? I thought they were rebuilding. Well, you kind of need a centerpiece for that rebuild. You got to, you know, have somebody, it's New York, you got to have an exciting player in there. And you've got to give other people around the league, you know, whether it's free agents or whatever it might be, a reason to want to play with the Rangers. And I think Panarin was that guy. Uh, besides that, you know, they um, w when they did the rebuild, they did the rebuild. You know, they pretty much uh, shipped out everybody that they could that year. I believe this was now the the six year anniversary, just a couple of year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, of um, the letter going out from the Ranger management announcing the rebuild. And 
you know, on one hand, there's some luck involved too. You know, you mentioned uh, the retirement of a, you know, slam dunk Hall of Fame goalie. Both our franchises have gone through that somewhat recently. But, you know, the lucky part of that was we had Igor Shesterkin, who was a fourth round draft pick. Um, how they got him that late, I'm really not sure. Because when you look at his career numbers, I mean, he's absolutely killed it in every league that he's ever played in. So I don't know, maybe there was like some hesitation about whether his game could translate to the NHL or not. But I mean, for me watching him play, I've, I've never really seen any reason to think that like he wouldn't be like at least a good, if not a great NHL goalie. So, I mean, you've got that, you know, Jacob Trouba, they trade for him and he's kind of the centerpiece of the defenseman, the same way that Panarin was, um, you know, for, um, for the forwards. And then, um, you know, you get a couple like trusted veterans in there as well. You know, Chris Kreider very easily could have not signed an extension going into the deadline the one season and uh, been traded away, but he wanted to stick it out with this team. And uh, he's one of the veteran leaders. So it's crazy. It's all just kind of come together very naturally. And I mentioned luck a second ago, the fact that they kind of uh, lucked their way in the NHL draft lottery, you know, picking number two and getting Kako, picking number one and getting Alexi Lafreniere. Now Kako, of course, has not quite become the player that I think a lot of people were hoping that he would be. There's times he's been a little bit snake bitten, but um, you know, at the very least, you know, steady third line player that that's the role that he's in right now and a good defensive forward and Lafreniere really taking off this year. I think uh, playing with Panarin has really benefited him. So there's really a little bit of everything going on. And um, you know, that, that run a couple of years ago in the playoffs when nobody even thought they would make the playoffs. And the next thing you know, they're in the conference final. Uh, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot even begin to explain how much fun that was. I'm sure it was kind of similar for you when the Canadians were making it to the finals a couple of years ago as well. Absolutely. And and you touched on Lafreniere, and I want to talk about that a little bit because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was a lot of, uh, not a lot of, it was just one year. It was one year of Uri Slavkovsky not looking like a first round pick or a first overall pick. Everybody was panicking. Everybody was dismissing him as a bust. And that slow build has kind of like, even, even at the beginning of the season, it took a while for him to really uh, get into his stride, to really be able to capture his moment. Um, so I wanted to talk about Lafreniere because he was also in that tough situation of, you know, a lot of his, like his seasons were cut short because of uh, COVID and all of that. He didn't really get much of a chance at first to kind of, you know, acclimate to the team and all of that with the measures in place at the time. But he's really, there's really like the next level has kind of come out this year, right? Like I believe even at the beginning of this year, we were having conversations about should the Canadians try to get him from the Rangers, right? So now in this season, I, w I wanted to know, like, there's a lot of narratives about uh, his development, and then there's the reality of his development. So from your perspective, was it just a slow build? Was it a matter of things just weren't in the right place at the right time? Is it just a matter of the line mates? Because, I mean, with Slavkovsky, too, we were like, play him on the top line with, with Suzuki and Caulfield. They finally did that, and now it's working, right? So what is it from your perspective? And from Canadians fans, like, I just want to, like, you know, why should we be patient is, is my question. <laughs> Well, patience is key when your team's rebuilding. You know, there's there's certainly going to be some growing pains in there, and there's going to be some losses that, you know, you, you just want to, like, smack yourself in the head when it happens. But, you know, with Lafreniere, it's a little bit of everything that you mentioned. I think for starters, you know, something that people have to remember is when the Rangers, again, they lucked their way into that first overall pick. They weren't, like, a bottom-of-the-barrel hockey team when they were picking first overall the way that the team with the first overall pick usually is. They weren't what I would call like a good team at that time either, but they at least, you know, the year there were 24 teams in the playoffs, they at least made it there. Um, so you bring in Lafreniere and that's great and everything, but you know, he's a left winger by trade and you've got Chris Kreider and Artemi Panarin in front of him. So you're left with uh, not like, I mean, obviously you're happy that you have him, but you look at the situation, it's like, well, you can't really put him above Kreider or Panarin. Uh, certainly not as an 18 year old rookie. So then the other option kind of becomes, well, do we move him to the right wing where there's not as much depth? And uh, that's what they've done this year. And um, he's really excelled there. You know, when he was first drafted and there was talk of uh, doing that with Lafreniere, I'm thinking like, you know, we got this guy, we lucked into this pick. He's the, he's going to be this awesome player. That's what everybody's saying. We really want to make like our first order of business be to ask this guy to switch positions. Not that like he can't possibly handle it, but it's just kind of like that. That's a weird first move. Um, and he's played there a little bit over the past couple of seasons. Um, but this year he's played there exclusively. I think playing with Artemi Panarin has worked wonders for his confidence. It just feels like the two of them kind of had an instant connection this season. And one thing that really stood out for me that seems to have improved from Lafreniere, and I noticed this very early in the season, his skating looks a lot better. It just feels like he moves around quite a bit better out there. And so it's funny, you know, last year people are like, 
trying to trade him and like like sell low on him. And you mentioned that maybe Montreal uh, was interested. And we've gone from that to a point now where Lafreniere is one of the players that like I worry the least about on this team. You know, he's up there as far as he's going to go out there and he's going to have a you know play a good game. I mean, you really do feel that way. And I mean, his his point total is not astronomical, but again, you you look at the way the Rangers are set up, and you know a lot of these first overall picks they get a ton of time with their team's top power play unit, and that hasn't really happened for him because they've got a lot of uh, people that are in that place, and and that's part of the reason why. I don't think his point total has been as high as expected in recent seasons, but yeah, he's taken off this year. And you know, the, the one thing that's always given me hope to year four for Lafreniere, every single season, he's been better than the year before, maybe not going at quite the pace that people would want, but the improvement has been noticeable season in season out. And if he never gets any better, he's already a really good player. I think he will continue to improve. And I do think this guy is the limit for Lafreniere. Do you see him as a key piece for the Rangers in the future? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he's um sooner or later like he's gonna core. be due a core player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think for sure. I mean, he's at a very reasonable cap hit right now. I, I do have that page open. I, I want to say like two million or something. <laughs> yeah, two point two point three two million. Um, and then uh he won't be an RFA until uh the season after next. So uh I do think they'll eventually, you know, make it a priority to get something done long term with Alexi Lafreniere. Uh some of these young players, even a couple of the guys on your team, Laura. Uh, some of the some of the contracts they're getting and some of the money that it's costing does make me a little nervous. But you know, reportedly that the cap, the salary cap, is supposed to go up next season, maybe even more the year after that. You know, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I, I think Lafreniere is going to be here for a long time. And um, you know, sooner or later, all these teams have tough decisions to make because the salary cap is so tight. But <laughs> I, at this point, I, I can't see them like, oh, we need cap relief. Let's move Alexi Lafreniere. I just, I don't think that's going to happen at this point. Yes, and it's a completely different conversation that was then was being had in the previous off season, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean pe- people are feeling really good, and you know this past off season, I feel like basically everybody on the Rangers uh, felt the uh, felt some heat from the the Ranger fan base a little bit because when you go out the way they did last year, you know you go up two nothing on the Devils and you lose in seven games, and uh, and it had to the be the Devils, games. right? <laughs> yeah, it had to be the Devils, you know, and you know the Devils that they. they that was their Stanley Cup. Those are their words, by the way, not mine. That their <laughs> players are saying that that was like their Stanley Cup. So maybe that's why they struggled this year. You know, maybe maybe they uh, they got a little their bellies got a little full after winning the Stanley Cups last season. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, I was just gonna say, like, I'm excited for our predictions because I think they're gonna be wildly different. <laughs> I do too. I think it's going to be fun. And um, in the meantime, Laura, would you like to let everybody know about uh, our second sponsor of today, which is, of course, our good friends at Game Time? Absolutely. So I was actually recently in New York. And one of the things that I like to do in New York is to partake partake in activities. Like I went to Broadway shows for the first time in my life. Um, And, you know, that's the kind of thing I like to do. I like to go to sports events, to the theater, stand up comedians, all of that. And sometimes it's hard to find tickets. I live in a big city and the tickets might seem like they're sold out. And or maybe I heard about it too late. And I know that getting tickets should not be stressful. It should not be frustrating. You should be able to get tickets right up until the start of the event or even within the event and you should be able to find them easily and not pay hidden fees and guess what game time is your go-to for just that to take all the guesswork out of buying tickets they've got last minute tickets they've got flash deals they've got zone deals and it's so easy to find and you can buy tickets in seconds with just two taps and the app like i said is so 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 easy to use and honestly, like I, I can't turn back. Once I heard about Game Time, once I learned about it, once I started using it, it truly just makes it such a piece of cake. And you too can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price guaranteed. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, keep everything rolling here. And Laura, I figure we might as well wrap up with a couple of predictions for this game. And, you know, they they played a crazy game against each other earlier this year. It was uh, back in early January in Montreal. Canadians go up 3-0. Rangers rally to tie it. We end up in a shootout. Canadians ultimately uh, do edge the Rangers. But um, (laughs) 
I I'm just wondering, I mean, wh what are we expecting from this game? Is it going to be crazy like this again? Is it going to be back and forth, high scoring, low scoring, any kind of feel there that, that you have for this one? Well, that going up multiple goals on the opponent and then giving up the lead has become kind of a trend this season. Um, it does, you know, it, it when whenever they do score goals, it's usually because the top line, everybody did the right thing, right? Like like Cole Caulfield did exactly what you expect. Uh, Nick Suzuki, Uri Slavkovsky. One thing that we are seeing that might have been, you know, improved even from that time about a month ago. Um, is the power play used to be abysmal, but now that they're using Slavkovsky on it, it is more of a threat. Like, so they don't really have a second wave right now, but their first wave consists of more threat and a lot more work for the penalty kill to do. So it is possible that the Canadians will be able to hang a couple goals on the Rangers, but at the same time, they keep giving up leads, and it's not usually the goaltending. Now, Jake Allen, it's a different story, but Samuel Montambo, who I would expect to be playing against a team with the Ranger caliber, um, that's usually who they'd start on a Saturday. It's usually That's usually who they'd start against a marquee team. So, you know, Thursday night, marquee team, I'm thinking it's probably Samuel Montambo. He's been playing really well. His stats are phenomenal despite the defense in front of him being terrible. And often you'll see that his goals against average doesn't really reflect his level of play but I do feel that it will be a situation where they might you know it might be a little bit more even this time because they've learned a lesson they really they 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 worked really hard against Dallas ultimately they couldn't pull it out they did have they did do the same thing where they allowed the lead to dissipate and then lost the game and then they were blown out by the St. Louis Blues and then they turned around and really uh turned things around against the Ducks they're coming off like a high they're confident but this is still a team that has many holes, many injuries. So whatever effort they're usually able to put together in that first um, uh, uh, period, I was going to say first segment, we're on a podcast. <laughs> it Usually the opposing team adjustments are usually too much to handle for a team at the Canadians caliber, which is not to knock them. It's just a reality. Yeah, absolutely. And um I wanted to ask you about this matchup because, you know, the Rangers right now, they're they're fifth in the league in power play, but they have really struggled. I think it's up to like six straight games now without them scoring a power play goal. And um, Montreal, I, I want to say, I was looking at it earlier, I want to say they're like fifth to last in the league, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. So, I mean, can can the Canadians, how have they done recently on the PK? Because the Rangers have got to figure this out. And I see that and it's like, <laughs> well, maybe they can at least get one. I mean, if you tell me they get one power play goal, I'd sign up for that. But just your thoughts on that matchup. I think it's highly possible. Uh, I really do. Uh, simply because this team, like it's like the, the area in which you see the rebuild most in which it's most evident is their defense, right? It's, it's all defensive situations. It's not just five on five. It's also the penalty kill. Um, a lot of times what happens is that they resort very much to either trying to block shots or like you're not seeing, they're not very dynamic. Um, a lot of times what I find with this defense is they're missing their assignments. They're missing their man, right? And there's like, it's partly inexperience and it's partly exhaustion. It's simply like the veterans have to play too much. And this, that's another thing going back to, you know, Martin St. Louis decisions sometimes. Uh, like Mike, poor Mike Matheson, he just, he plays too much for his ability. And he's a very serviceable defenseman. You know, somebody like that, he gets relied on too much. Like Caden Gooley is like a little bit injury prone. He's still learning. Like he's, I, I have a lot of faith in Caden Gooley. But sometimes those growing pains come out. Now Jordan Harris is not there, right? And he was one of the um, the staples for keeping the puck out of the net and keeping um, the puck under control. To, like to, to you know to allow the Canadians to keep control of the puck is what I meant to say. So right now you're already dealing with injuries and a less than ideal lineup. And then you're talking about a strategy that simply hasn't worked. And like, and I think part of it is with the coaching staff, right? Like if defensemen keep missing their assignments, it's not necessarily all on them. Sometimes it's the strategy at play or what they're being asked to do is not clear, it's not cohesive, or it's being asked in such a way that they can't go back to their basics. So for me, like, I'm feeling pretty confident that the Rangers will probably be able to hang at least one power and play goal. Well, I'll take that at this point, because like I said, when you go <laughs> six games without one, it's like, yeah, sign me up. I'll, I'll take the one power play goal. That works for me. Um, I wanted to ask you, too, like, is there, like, maybe, like, an under-the-radar player that we should keep an eye on as Ranger fans, somebody that maybe isn't necessarily a household name, but he's impressed you lately, somebody that, that's played well in recent games? 
Well, we'll see if he's in the lineup, but um, they recently gave an NHL contract to an AHL player who's had a stellar stellar season just so that they could add him to this lineup to make up for some injuries. So his name is Brendan Jiniak. Uh, Not somebody that I even, I don't, I don't think we even talked about him prior to last season, except for, for when he scored in the playoffs, right? For the Laval Rocket. So he's somebody that honestly has been a little bit more impressive, but for me, it's dependent on whether Martin St. Louis plays him enough or not. Yes, he Linen. Like he could be a threat offensively. He absolutely could be. He's generally playing around 11 to 13 minutes a night, which is not necessarily ideal because that's not the right line for him, right? Like he should be higher up in the lineup. He should be, um, he should be used in more situations, including on that power play, maybe put him on that second wave or something like that. So it's not like Martin St. Louis. Sometimes it, it shows like he shows flashes of using him correctly. And then sometimes he just doesn't allow it. And this player has more to give than what he's been allowed to show. So if I were a Rangers fan, that would be somebody that I would be watching out for just in case Martin St. Louis surprises and, and puts him in uh, more offensive situations. Sounds good. And uh, if, I'm, if I can throw one out for the Rangers, I would say keep an eye on Will Cooley, a uh, 22-year-old rookie and something of a surprise. You know, he made the team out of training camp, but he played very well in camp and in the preseason and just kind of like a hard nosed throwback player. Um, I believe he still leads the NHL in hits by a rookie. And, um, you know, I know, you know, sometimes Jacob Trubo will come under fire from other fan bases and people will say, Oh, he's dirty and this and that. Um, and he does toe the line at times, but will Cooley, when he lays in a hit, I mean, it's clean as a whistle every single time he's begun to, uh, provide some more offense recently. And that third line, you know, depth has been an issue for the Rangers like it is for, I think, basically just about every team in the NHL. Every every team always wants a little more depth. But that third line, uh, recently they've been going with Cooley, Brodzinski, and Kako, and it feels like such a random trio of players, but it's kind of been working. And um, <laughs> the three of them linked up to score, um, you know, a really blue-collar goal in the last game against the Flames. And uh, not counting an empty netter, that was the only goal that was scored. So I'm going to go Will Cooley. You know, I, I hope he can do something offensively. But if not, I'm, I'm sure he'll at least lay in a big hit or two and um, maybe catch uh, the attention of Canadians fans that way. I think so. Are we ready to predict? I think so. Um, who you got? Uh, what's the final score? Who scores a goal? All that good stuff. What do you got? All right. I think um, Nick Suzuki. Actually, it's Cole Caulfield's turn. I think he scores a goal. Um, you know, on the, in the last game, uh, Slavkovsky and Suzuki really brought it, and um, and Cole Caulfield didn't really get a shout out on the on on the plays, but he was definitely involved. So I think it's his turn to start. You know scoring some goals. Maybe he has one goal, maybe two. I think it's 4-2 to the Rangers, though. I have the same final score. I'm going to say 4-2 for the Rangers. And, you know, kind of sticking with what I just talked about a second ago, that that third line is is gelling and slowly but surely starting to put it together a little bit. I'm going to say Capo Caco puts one in the net. Um, You know, obviously, it's been a tough season for him. The points haven't been there and missed a ton of time due to injury. But um, he has played well recently, almost scored in the last one. Settled for the assist, but um, yeah, give me Kako to score and uh, give me a 4-2 Ranger win at the uh, at the end of the night there. And our listeners will have to check SiriusXM um, for that game to see if we're going to be right. Absolutely. And so, uh, yeah, again, uh, Laura, there's a ton of fun. We will definitely have to do this uh, sometime in the future, maybe uh, in the off season or, you know, whatever it might be. Heading up to the draft, maybe? Yes, I like that idea a lot, for sure, for <laughs> sure. And who did, they might even strike a trade, these two teams. You never know for sure. That, that could happen you going into know. the deadline, so... We'd have something to talk about then for sure. But um, yeah, Ranger fans, Canadian fans, thank you guys as always for tuning in and we will see you next time.